UCAS, which is University of Gothenburg's Network for Critical Animal Studies in the Anthropocene. It's a cross-disciplinary network for critical animal, critical animal studies, animal rights, and sustainability. And our aims and visions are to explore novel approaches to environmental problems, social injustice, and climate change. Approaches that engage both theory and practice. We also aim to provide input to course development and research practices, contribute to an ethically and environmentally sustainable campus free from animal use, as well as to work for a transition to plant-based food on campus. And GUCAS is a space for knowledge production, exchange, and collaboration, a platform where people from different parts of the university, so students, teachers, and staff, uh, as well as social movements and civil society in general can come together and meet each other. And our aim is to enable collaborations both locally and globally. And anyone who's interested in the work of GUCAS is more than welcome to join our network. So please do reach out uh, if you're interested and uh, perhaps we can share uh, our email address in the, in the chat later on if you're interested. So, and today, apart from everybody participating online, we also have gathered at two locations in person, um, at Lund University in Sweden, where we are here in this room, and also at Edge Hill University in the UK. And no matter from where you're attending, you are very warmly welcome. So we will soon give the floor to today's speaker, Patrice Jones. Just a few words on practicalities first. So shortly, uh, Maria will introduce uh, Patrice Jones, and then Patrice will present, and then there will be a Q&A. Um, and uh, we also kindly ask everyone to please keep your questions for after the lecture. And to ask a question, please either write them in the chat or raise your virtual hand, which you, sh you should be able to find under reactions at the bottom of your screen. And that's if you'd like to ask a question out loud. So uh, once again, um, very welcome. And now I hand over to Maria, who will int introduce Patrice Jones. Yes, thank you so much, Daniel. And hello, everybody. I'm super happy to introduce Patrice Jones. And Patrice is one of the founders of Vine Sanctuary, which is a place where over 500 animals who were once exploited now live and call home. And in this home, human and non-human animals live together as a multi-species community and work towards making the world a fairer and safer place for everybody. Before starting Vine, Patrice was busy helping as a tenant organizer and teaching as an anti-racist educator and teaching also college and university classes about how to make real changes in society. Patrice has written several amazing works that bring insights arising within that multi-species community into the critical animal studies conversation. One of their books, The Oxen at the Intersection, tells the story of trying to rescue two oxen and shows why it is important to care about the intersections between animal exploitation and other forms of oppression. Their latest book, Bird's Eye Views is a collection of essays of, on big questions about activism, animals, um, ecofeminism, emotion, queerness, and many more. So let's give a warm welcome to Patrice Jones. Hi, everybody. Um, let me uh, change the view, good. So uh, thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me. I agree that anyone who doesn't want to be recorded should keep themselves blank. But anyone who doesn't mind, I would very much appreciate it if you turned your camera on because it's very awkward for me to talk to black boxes. 
Um, and I do a lot better if I can actually see the the people with whom I am trying uh, to, to 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 commune. So I see that some people are are, are turning them, their cameras on, and I thank you very much for that, especially as someone who really hates being filmed. Um, so I appreciate uh, you being willing to to be seen to make it a little easier for me. Um, I have a lot to say, but I, I want to make sure that. As uh, the introducers just did, I want to handle the administrative or businessy type things first because otherwise I will forget to say them at the end. Uh, so I am from Vine. Thank you so much for describing our multi species community. I do want to encourage you to visit our website, vinesanctuary.org, and also to follow us on social media where you can meet members of our multi species community. I also want to recommend that you sign up for our newsletter, which you can do via our website, because we often use that to share ideas arising out of the sanctuary, and most importantly, to advertise uh, events, uh, online events, such as our monthly Vine Book Club, where we meet uh, to read the kind of books that people who would come to a session like this like to read. Uh, and the meetings are on the last Sunday of every month at what I think is about 8 p.m. for you. Uh, and there are people who, who tune in from Europe, so I know it's possible. Uh, and then uh, thank you so much for shouting out the new book. It's called Bird's Eye Views, Queer Queries About Activism, Animals, and Identity. And um, it includes 33 essays written over the past 30 years. Uh, and one of the readers who talked about it at book club said that what she liked about it was that she felt like she was learning to think. Um, and so it really walks you th through the thought process of looking at intersections like animal exploitation and capitalism, for example. Um, uh, if you're particularly interested in um, uh well, the topics of today, uh, the other book uh, that, that was just mentioned, The Oxen at the Intersection, just takes one single case study uh, of, of an actually failed activist effort uh, and then walks you through how factors such as sexism and racism and colonialism and ableism interfered with the efforts of activists to rescue uh, two cows and bring them to a sanctuary. All right, all of that said, let's get ourselves situated. I always worry that virtual meetings will be so disembodied as to feel abstract. And that's a danger, particularly here, because what we're talking about is all about bodies and action uh, in, the, in, the, in the real world. So here I am, I'm coming to you from the part of what's now called North America that is now called Vermont, uh, the original homeland of the Abenaki people. Uh, and uh, this is a photo behind me, but I am in fact looking out at the forest and these forests were co-created by beavers and turkeys and other animals literally millions of years before modern humans even evolved, much less made their way to this place. You are also situated in a place that was co-created by members of the larger than human world long before humans existed, much less arrived in that particular place. And so I encourage you just for a minute before we dive in to take a nice deep breath. And now when you take your next breath, I want you to remember that the oxygen that you're breathing in was made in part by the trees that are around you. And that those trees depend on networks of fungi and they also depend on the soil 
which is itself co-created by underground animals, both micro and macro. And so every time you breathe in, you're breathing in the exhalations of trees. You, of course, need to breathe to exist, which means you absolutely depend upon uh, these networks. And they've been there for you your whole life, whether you were conscious of them or not. Now I would like you to think about the chain of um, circumstances and choices that led you to be here right now. Because what's true, even though it's just a Zoom lecture, uh, but the fact of the matter is that like literally everything in your life led up to this moment. That's true at every moment. So I, I, I would just like you to think about the circumstances beyond your control, as well as the choices that you made that led you to be interested in the things that you're interested in. And then, um, come to this gathering that you're in on in person or discover this um online event and decide to tune in and the reason i want you to just think about that for a moment is because you like everybody else are existing at the conjunction of numerous systems, social systems, ecosystems, economic systems, the systems inside you that make up your organism. Um, and they're all interacting all the time, leading you to be at particular points. And this is true for everyone, including all of the people whose minds and behavior you hope to change. And so it can be super useful to be aware of the forces, including the forces beyond your control, that lead you to be who you are, where you are, when you are. And this is all a part of what I call ecologic, which is a habit or practice of thinking and working within multiple systems, within the reality that we are systems within systems, as are all of the people um, whose um, practices we hope to influence in some way or another. Now here, let me give you an example. We're having an early spring. Are you having an early spring too? Yeah. So we're having an early spring. It's a, it's a lovely spring day here today. And um, the organism that is me is so happy about spring. The organism that is me is just thrilled viscerally by the warmth and the sight of green and the feeling of spring breezes and the fresh springness in the air. My organism is, the organism is so happy. At the same time, the subsystem of me that is my conscious thinking is well aware that this is because of climate change, which is super alarming and in fact terrifying. Now, climate change is of course about the climate system going haywire in large part because of the machinations of the economic systems created by our species. And 
if we want to do anything at all to mitigate the harm, then we're going to have to keep in mind not only all the facts we know about climate systems and methane and carbon and the like, but also all the things we know about social systems and and um, and the systems that are humans um, and how and why people do what they do or don't do uh, what they don't do. And so here I am with this energy from spring, but plus also this energy from being alarmed. And the question then is, what will I do with it? And this is where I think that ecologic or systems thinking uh, can be really useful. I presume you're familiar with the fundamentals of ecological thinking, the, the idea that um, um, everything is, um, nothing is existing in a vacuum. There are networks of physical relationships uh, which uh, can and are influenced by shifts in the system, um, that sometimes these may be invisible relationships, so that something like, um, I don't know, a smokestack in the city uh, can end up leading to the deaths of amphibians hundreds of miles away. But there's ways of thinking about social systems as well. And one of those is uh, often referred to as intersectionality, uh, which is a which is a, a term that was coined um, by the by the black feminist legal scholar Kimberly Kremshaw um, and elaborated by numerous um, black feminists and other feminists. So I'm going to talk quickly about that way of thinking about um, social systems um, or at least about the social systems which are um, to blame for social injustice, uh, social systems such as racism, sexism, forms such systems of oppression, such as racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, and the like. Now, this, um, like all important ideas, this important idea has an intellectual history. And the, uh, the history is that um, uh, uh, at some point, uh, in the in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, people were using the phrase double jeopardy uh, to talk about the experiences of, of black women in the United States. And, and, and this was reflecting uh, this idea that they were doubly um, um, disadvantaged uh, by both racism and sexism. Huh? Um, but then Kimberly Crenshaw and other black feminists were like, no, that simplistic additive way of thinking, you know, like racism plus sexism equals worse, doesn't quite capture what's actually happening. Because what's actually happening is that racism and sexism are combining in ways that lead uh, black women to be disadvantaged in unique ways. So it's not just that they're experiencing the problems that white women experience plus the problems that black men experience, uh, but they're 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 experiencing unique forms of disadvantage um, that are not shared uh, by either white women or black men. Uh, uh, and and so this is the first important insight of 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 um, of, of thinking intersectionally, and and this is that uh, systems of oppression interact with one another to in in a way that's more multiplicative um, than additive, in in that it leads to um, new 
um, conjoined forms of oppression. And of course, um, uh, scholars and activists have 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 thought about this in 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 many uh, expansive ways, uh, going well beyond uh, and into intersections between ableism and racism, or intersections uh, between um, uh, homophobia and uh, racism, etc. Um, the other, the next important thing to to learn to to remember is um, that since the systems interact with one another in ways that um, not only lead to new forms of, in, of disadvantage um, that harm people at particular intersections, um, but also the, the different systems of oppression tend to um, support one another. They have... Um, uh, and compound one another. They have um, shared features, shared intellectual roots, shared historic roots, uh, and um, and 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 this can make it um, difficult, if not impossible, to uh, solve remedy one form of oppression if you're if you're not mindful of the others. Um, here in the United States, the most classic example of that is um, is uh, when um, when uh, feminists who are interested in 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 protecting survivors of, of domestic violence um, instituted uh, what are called mandatory arrest laws, uh, which meant that when police were called out, to um, the uh, a domestic violence uh, situation, um, they were not allowed, uh, as police used police men used to do. They would come out. They would say, "Oh, it's just an argument," and they would go away, even if there was clear evidence of assault. Um, and so these mandatory arrest laws said, "No, no, no. You don't have that. If you come out on a domestic call." Uh, and you see bruising or any sort of evidence of uh, of, of physical fighting, then you you must arrest the perpetrator, um, even if the victim is telling you they don't that she doesn't want him arrested, um, because she might be saying that just because she's scared of him. Um, well, in the context of um, of um, institutional racism, uh, those policies ended up harming. Uh, black women who were survivors of domestic violence, uh, who themselves would end up getting being arrested by the police because they were angry um, and uh, 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 so um, uh, and and to this day, uh, there are numerous um, uh, black women in um, car incarcerated uh, from fighting back. Uh, against domestic violence, specifically because of laws that were intended uh, to help them. Um, and so this is just one little example of, although very important to anyone who is in, affected by it, uh, of, 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 of how these different systems of oppression are always operating together. And so if you, if you, if you, if you try to remedy a situation without being mindful of all the intersections, you can, um, you can often um, either fail to solve the problem or in fact create new harm. Um, and then um, another important thing is all of this thinking, all of this thinking was done for practical purposes. None, none of this thinking uh, has been done for abstract academic purposes. Um, uh, However intellectually fascinating it might be to think about the interactions among systems, um, uh, the point is to um, be effective uh, social change agents. And so uh, two important um, I'm just going to say things because I can't think of the right noun um, uh, come from this. 
Uh, one is what I was just saying, uh, which is you, 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 even if you're focusing on a what seems like a single simple problem, it's essential to be mindful of the intersections at which that problem exists. Even if you're not trying to solve all of the intersecting problems, to just be aware. That way you won't accidentally, I don't know, do like some animal rights activists have done and use sexism to try and save animals, thereby harming um, women and the movement. Um, at the same time as you're trying, sincerely trying, uh, to 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 do something good, um, and and then the, the 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 other important piece, strategically important piece for any of us who really want to make sustained and sustainable change, is that because the systems are mutually supportive, because the systems of oppression are mutually supportive. You're actually going to mm, have the best prospect of making major change if you work deliberately at the intersections. Right? If you think about how systems are maintained, it's the it's the joints that hold them together. And if you pull out the joints, uh, that helps to make the system collapse. Um, and so it can be very useful, whatever problem you're working on, to, to, to spend time really thinking about where the intersections are between this one problem you're trying to solve and other problems and see if you can't find uh, some problem to work on um, that 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 in that involves multiple systems of oppression and focus on that one because it's more destabilizing to the system and two because then you're going to have a a, 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 a wider, circle of potentially interested um, people uh, to uh, who may not agree with you about everything else, but who are interested in this problem, which is an intersection. Um, uh, 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 an example of that here within in the United States, for example, is 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 um, is dairy, um, which is um, uh, here in the United States, uh, given to ch all children in free and subsidized um, breakfast and lunch programs, um, even though so many uh, children, uh, particularly uh, uh, students of um, African, Asian, uh, and Native American descent, are lactose intolerant. And of course, if you drink milk when you're lactose intolerant, then you get headaches um, and you gas. Um, and that actually is not really good for academic achievement. Um, and so um, a, a, a simple thing like let's get plant-based alternatives into our local school is a problem that animal activists and vegan activists and anti-racist activists and folks who are interested in the environment and folks who are interested in health um, and folks who are just interested in uh, people having more choices in schools, all of, can come together on that um, and work on a problem like that. So work at the intersections. So now um, I'm hoping all that's clear. If it's not, you'll ask me at the end. And now I promised case examples in the abstract. So I feel obliged uh, to, uh, to give some case examples of intersections involving speciesism, hmm? involving speciesism. So, and this will allow me to make another point 
which uh, I didn't put into the abstract, but is super important to me. And I always make sure I, I say when I'm talking uh, to animal activists or animal study scholars, which is that um, we uh, have to, uh, if we are serious about um, um, undermining human supremacy, uh, we have to we have to be willing not just to uh, study animals, but to learn or learn about animals, but to learn from animals um, as individuals and, and collectivities. Um, and, and as it happens, both of these examples involve me um, learning things from animals. So uh, uh, the 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 vine is now some I don't know. 24 years old, and there are, as uh, as was said, uh, always more than 500 animals um, in residence, including uh, chickens, cows, goats, sheep, um, pigeons, uh, alpacas, emus, geese, turkeys, ducks, 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 so many ducks. But it all started um, as a sanctuary for chickens. Um, in the part of the country, uh, the part of this country where a factory farming of chickens was invented and perfected, a, a peninsula where they kill and cut up more than a million birds every day. Um, and it all started when uh, Vine co-founder Miriam Jones and I um, found a chicken in a ditch by the side of the road. Um, we brought her home. This was in early 2000. We brought her home and um, there wasn't any place to take her. So we set up a little spot in the garage for her. She had jumped or fallen from a truck headed for the slaughterhouse. We were on just a couple heck, uh, acres. I don't know what that is in it, hectares of, of land literally surrounded by factory farms. Um, and um, so we brought her home, got attached. She got attached to us too. And um, really got close because uh, we got worried about cold weather. So we'd bring her into the bathroom um, in the, in the, during, over cold nights. And, uh, you know, you spend a lot of time in there. So, uh, you know, I noticed like she had my grandmother's eyes as uh, well as her personality. So, um, oh, and I would, would look at her hands. Her, the, I don't know if you've ever looked at the bottoms of chickens' feet, but they, they have the little sections just like our fingers, right? And then the nails, like I, the first time I saw that, I was like, wow. I mean, I knew in my head that like all of the animals on the planet are related, but this is clearly a relative of mine, right? Named her after my grandmother, got really attached, and um, <clears throat> then she started crowing. And uh, turns out that 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 she's a rooster, and for about a day or two after the fairly comical event in which I learned that all of these choking sounds she was making were crowing. Um, I felt different. Like all of these stereotypes about roosters were like flooding into my head. Like they're aggressive and they're cocky and they want to rule the roost. And, um, at the same time, I was like, no, this is not true. Like, this is just the same bird. This is my, this is, this is my friend. And, and, um, and my friend is not any of those things. Um, so, uh, I worked really hard to, to, to like take off those stereotype colored spectacles and, and see her for herself again. But as a feminist, I was just like, whoa, where did these ideas come from? Like, I grew up in a city. I grew up in Baltimore City. 
Um, I, you know, nobody, nobody who was raising me talked to me about chickens or told me that roosters were this way or that way. So like, how did I get, like, how do I have such fixed and rigid ideas about what a rooster is? Um, and, and then I, I, I realized it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, children's books and, um, cartoons and um, children's movies, stories, right? Um, so then I thought, well, that's really interesting. What's up with what's up with um, what's up with all of these um, these media portrayals for children that? Are stereotyping roosters and I was like whoa well of course all these stereotypes are like traditional masculinity and masculinity of the most toxic variety and for people for humans like anything that's that's like that's true for animals is presumed to be natural right so i realized that what was happening is that chickens roosters in particular but hens too were being used to perpetrate to naturalize social constructions, to make the social construction of gender seem like nature. And of course, this hurts everybody. It, it hurts. Um, you don't need me to tell all of the reasons that 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 toxic masculinity um, you know, leads to actions that hurt um, the women and animals and 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 the larger than human world, and also hurts boys and men very much. And it also hurts the the birds themselves. You might think, well, who, who, who does it matter to them how people think of them? Well, yes, because that influences how people treat them. And for example, there is cockfighting which has been um, done um, uh, to roosters uh, for literally thousands of years. Um, and I don't have time today to, to walk you through the whole process, but basically the way that cockfighting, that's a blood sport where, where roosters are, are tricked into fighting, forced or tricked into fighting each other. Um, but basically what happens is that the birds are raised in isolation, so they don't they don't learn the social signals by which roosters will normally resolve their conflicts. Um, they're mutilated in various ways uh, so that they will seem like predators to each other and, and treat each other like predators rather than conspecifics. Um, they're often um, um, doped up with testosterone or methamphetamines. Um, they have um, uh, knives attached to their legs. It's really brutal. Um, and I, 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 so so it really hurts birds too. Um, before I move on to the next example of a, of a conjunction of, of a form of oppression among humans and, and speciesism, I just want to say that um, uh, as it happened, I, we learned from roosters uh, how uh, roosters resolve conflicts. Uh, and then I took that and combined it with my training in clinical psychology to, um, to come up with a protocol for the rehabilitation of roosters used in cockfighting, uh, who prior to us coming up with this were, uh, were uniformly uh, simply euthanized on the presumption that they were so inherently aggressive uh, that they couldn't possibly uh, live peacefully. Um, those are, of course, just lies rooted in the myths 
Uh, and uh, so we, we developed this protocol. We've been rescuing and rehabilitating uh, former fighting roosters for more than 20 years now, and, and shelters and sanctuaries around the world now use, uh, use our methods. Um, but the, the, the problem isn't uh, solved. By, by any means. Uh, so, so I wanna tell you something else I learned from, from uh, uh, let me show, uh, I'm gonna tell you about another intersection by means of another thing that I learned from, from animals. So um, at some point, still in our original location, uh, we took in a group of ducks um, who had been rescued um, in an open rescue uh, from a foie gras factory. Um, and uh, we weren't really set up for them. We were a chicken sanctuary, but they just, they needed a, a place. And um, do, we were not sorry. I don't know if you have ever met ducks, uh, but they are th among the most delightful people uh, you would ever want to know, so social, talking all the time, talking smack about you, talking to each other, um, just amazingly wonderful people. Uh, but, 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 and, 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 and they were big. And so we had to put like half of them in one hoop and the other half and another that were separated um, by some things. And, um, and before we separated them, we tried to figure out like who was friends with who. Um, uh, but they didn't have many friends. I mean, they were fresh out of the factory farm where they had been in individual cages. So they didn't have, um, or so I thought, didn't have deep relationships. So um, one day, not long after they came, I, I got to know them. I loved them. I was so excited by them. They were so nice to the chickens. They were so nice to each other. They were so nice to me. So I was really shocked one day when I came out and I found two of them fighting. So I was like, nah, no, 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 no. This is a sanctuary. Like even former fighting roosters do not fight here. We do not fight here. So I, 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 I tried to separate them, but the one who was attacking kept, Kept so I was like, okay, I'll separate you. I took the one who I thought was the victim and carried him over to the other yard, uh, so that where he would be safe. And went about my business, went back in the house, came back out a couple hours later to find the one I had rescued trying to climb a fence to get back in with the person and the person he had been fighting with, like talking to him as he's climbing the fence. Now, now this might seem amazing to you, but it was even more amazing because what he actually had to do to get to where he was, was he had to like walk through the yard. He had to climb a six foot fence and walk through the woods, take a sharp left turn, walk down the road, take another left turn up the driveway and then start to climb one last fence. That's where I saw him. So I was like, whoa, okay, you two must be friends. You just had an argument. It's cool. I lifted him up. They talked, talked, talked to each other and then walked away. I went and did what I was doing, turned around, they're fighting again. Three times. I separated them. Three times. The one I put a a, the victim walked through the woods and down the road and around up the fence until I literally hit my head with my hand as it as I realized th 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 that it wasn't fighting it was sex um th they were boyfriends and um, so I called them um, Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude uh, because they both looked like they were wearing little black berets and, um, and they were partners. They were partners for life. They, um, I'm not saying they were monogamous because ducks are not, um, but 
they spent most of every day together. They slept together every night. And for about seven years, until finally um, Jean-Paul uh, died due to the liver problems that the factory had induced. And then um, Jean-Claude, who had seemed perfectly healthy, uh, died a few days later. So, the thing about this is that I had read this book called um, Biological Exuberance, uh, which was written in the late 1990s and uh, described the hundreds of uh, species of non-human animals for whom same-sex uh, sexual relations um, are common. And in fact, I knew that ducks were among them. And yet, my first presumption was, was that it was fighting. And if he hadn't been just so intent on getting back to his partner, you know, I might not have never, I might not have figured it out. So again, we had this moment where I'm like, what is going on in my head uh, here? Uh, and, you know, in, in a way we came back to all of the children's media I had, um, uh, consumed, which, you know, routinely portray animals in heterosexual couplings. I thought about all the nature programs I had seen where um, reproduction is, is presumed to be like the thing that non-human animals are trying to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and all of this was so strong that I, a queer woman who somewhere in my brain did know that um, that most duck, male ducks are bisexual, um, tried to separate two boyfriends. So again, that really got me thinking about this conjunction, this time of, of speciesism and homophobia, because again, it hurts both. Like those of us who are queer know, like the um, one of the most natural thing, the most common things that's said about us, um, or as an excuse for um, oppressing us, is it's not natural, right? Um, but it also harms animals grievously to see them as. Um, Wait, before we get to how it harms animals. So again, we're back at um, using animals in service of social constructs. And this, uh, before we were talking about masculinity, now we're talking about heteronormativity. Um, but either way, what's what's happening is in popular culture and particularly in, um, in culture uh, that is consumed by children long before they are critical thinkers enough uh, to understand what messages they're getting um, are, are being used to naturalize social constructs and make them look um, like uh, they are natural rather than the social constructs that they are. Um, and, and, and so, of course, that hurts us queers anything, anytime uh, and, and anybody else who, who isn't... Um, um, who hasn't chosen to center reproduction in their lives. Uh, but it, it harms animals grievously too, uh, to be perceived as reproducing automatons. Um, think about it. If you, um, if you admit to yourself that ducks just for example, might hang out with each other just because they wanna have sex just for the pleasure of it. Have no interest in reproducing, but adopt a chicken, um, an injured chicken. Those ducks did that, by the way. Um, 
then you have to acknowledge that they they are what we would call sentient. You have to acknowledge that they have feelings and wishes, desires. Hmm? That makes it a lot harder to lock them up in foie gras factories or vivisection labs. But if they're just reproducing robots, whose every action is determined by um, some inbuilt um, um, drive to reproduce, well then, it becomes much easier to lock them up. Hmm? So we have another conjunction uh, where um, uh, two different forms of oppression, in this case, speciesism and homophobia, are, are in the same place in this, this depiction, this false depiction, of 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 non-human animals as uh, um, reproducing robots, and uh, and this is something that hurts both, and so again a, a potential avenue for intervention, which luckily we've been seeing in in recent years, lots and lots of of mass media attention uh, to uh, to uh, same sex relations um, among non-human animals. Um, so that does bring us to sites of sites of intervention, which is another thing I promised. Um, so you won't be surprised then to hear me say that I think toxic masculinity um, itself is a um, is a site of um, intervention. Uh, if you think about. Uh, the ways that um, that toxic masculinity, by which I mean masculinity uh, uh, rooted in the idea that to be masculine is to exert power and control over others uh, uh, using force if necessary. Um, and to um, compete with other men um, for the spoils of maleness, such as um, uh, land and and women and animals, all or as property. Hmm? Then, um, so 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 this way of being masculine, this idea of masculinity, is associated not just with cockfighting, but all sorts of of harm to non-human animals, bullfighting and um, hunting and um, fishing. And um, uh, and it's also associated, research tells us, with um, refusal to um, do things like carry reusable bags. So it's it, it, and it's associated with what um, some scholars have called petromasculinity, uh, which involves the big cars and other gas guzzling um, mechanisms, um, and of course it's associated with harm done not only to animals but to partners and children, um, and. Again, uh, harms the boys and men who uh, who contort themselves into it. Hmm? So, I think that's one site of intervention. Um, but. And human supremacy itself. But, you know, human supremacy itself is hard to work on. So, so let me just talk about this. So, so human supremacy itself. Um, you probably know, and we could spend hours talking about the ways that it intersects with um, every form of, um, of harm um, that humans do to each other. Right. So if 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 the theory, the theory of intersectionality tells us that all the different forms of harm that are that 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 humans do to each other are connected. Hmm? And then if we take that further, 
the sort of eco-feminist spin on that is to say, okay, yes, all of that is connected. And all of that is connected to, uh, 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 is related to uh, how humans um, harm uh, the larger than human world, including animals. Um, and and the same kind of um, interconnectedness is, is going on there. So, and, and we can break it down, right? We can, we can, we can, we can look at something like, um, we, we can break down the ways that human supremacy, that the idea of the human, the very idea of the human, uh, and you've probably read some work about this, the very idea of the human leads pretty directly uh, to racism. Ableism is built right into it. Um, and 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 other forms of harm that humans do to do to each other. But uh, it's not um, it's not always that easy to um, to directly attack human supremacy. Um, uh, I, I I think that we can, and Val Plumwood, um, you know, has uh, has some good ideas. Val Plumwood, the Australian ecofeminist philosopher, has some some good ideas for how to do that. That involve um, um, now I'm going off what I what I meant to say, but I'll go ahead. Uh, uh, so. This involves um, talking about the larger than human world in ways that stress its agency. Challenging what Val Plumwood did is, um, is she looked at what she called centrisms, um, anthropocentrism, androcentrism, eurocentrism. And, and identified the the features that they all shared. And so she thought if you can if you can go to those features, then you can undermine some of those systems. So for example, one feature is a false independence, right? Uh, it's being actually dependent on the subordinate, but seeing yourself as independent and superior. Uh, and so uh, uh, men do this with women. Uh, white people do this with non-white uh, people, and um, and humans do it with the larger than human world constantly, right? We make ourselves into the hero of the story, the independent hero of the story, rather than um, one little part of the story that's actually dependent on the whole. Um, so, uh, so she. Uh, uh, another involves stereotyping. The other, um, another involves um, backgrounding. The other, and so uh, she came up with some strategies in that are in the essay in my new book that's called Birds Beyond Words. Um, and there's also a um, video online of a talk that I give to the Australasian Animal Studies Association called Birds Beyond Words. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in, in a more coherent description of that, because I wasn't planning to say it, it just popped into my head, uh, you, can, you can go to that and you, you'll hear all the things that Val Plumwood suggested, and I absolutely second. So I do think that there are ways that we can directly challenge human supremacy, but I also think um, because human supremacy and ableism are so um, deeply connected, as to be in some ways the same thing. That um, attacking ableism is going to be um, a useful avenue for undermining human supremacy. Since ableism is built into human, 
if we can wobble ableism more, I think that's going to wobble human. Just an idea. Something that we're working on as a as a as a sanctuary that, as it happens, was founded by people with disabilities, um, and is predominantly staffed by people with disabilities. Um, I know it's time to shift to questions and answers, so let me just say in conclusion. Um, I think it's really useful to be aware of yourself as a system within systems. Even if that means, ooh, wobbling um, individual identity a little bit. And um, challenging your own human supremacy. Because that's another way to direct to undermine human supremacy is to really challenge our own just because you've um, decided to be vegan or decided to be an animal activist or decided to be an animal studies scholar, uh, it doesn't like suddenly rid you of um, ingrained ways of thinking. Um, and the more that you can do to um, discover and uproot them in yourself, the better able you will be to influence others for example one well this comes to the next one okay yeah so i said we're systems within systems and we're the type of system that is powered by emotion we're the type of system that's powered by emotion now human supremacy tells us that we're rash the rational animal that is a lie it's not just a lie about animals and their rationality it's a lie about humans that exaggerates our own rationality. Um, we are animals who are um, motivated by emotion, including desire. And so if we treat other humans like they, they in, in, in human supremacy they treat they tr it treats it treats it treats non-human animals like reproducing robots and it teach it treats humans like um thinking machines but we're not they're not reproducing robots and we're not thinking machines and so um it really shouldn't be so much of a surprise that all of our efforts to rationally argue people out of speciesism um don't work for the most part because people are systems driven by emotion and shaped by material factors, factors that make it harder or easier to do this thing or that thing. So recognizing ourselves as systems within systems helps us to then recognize other people as systems within systems and that allows us to a lot more accurately analyze problems and devise interventions interventions that see problems as situations at convergences of numerous systems all of which can be tinkered with And then I think back to um, the story I told you about Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude. Um, I mean, really think about what that was like for Jean-Claude. There was this giant ape who kept taking him away from his boyfriend. And he just said no and kept going back to his boyfriend, no matter what the ape did. We have that same ability. The history of queerness shows it, right? You can outlaw us, you can, you can, you can give, you can make it the death penalty. Doesn't stop it. 
because we are social animals among the emotions, chief among the emotions driving us is the drive for relationships. We all want relationships. We want good relationships. We want relationships, not just sexual relationships. We want deep, intimate relationships with other humans. We want better rela We want relationships with the larger than human world. One of the one of the the, the saddest thing about cockfighting is that the men who participated in it, they, they they're harming the birds at the same time as they adore the birds and expend all this time in taking care of the birds. That's desire. That's a healthy desire to be close to birds perverted by toxic masculinity that says you can only be ca caring towards others in the context of using them for combat. So, so we've all got this power that might upsurge on a day when your body is happy about spring, but it, it, it's always there. And, and, and so you can always use it. You can always use it. You can always call upon it for your own work. But the trick is to remember that it's there in everybody, including the people who you want to influence to be different, including the people whose behavior you want to change, whose ideas you want to change, right? And so insofar as possible, using tactics that will call to that wish for relationship among others, I think is um, the most likely to be fruitful way of working. Remembering the people or systems within systems and calling to their deep, deep wish for better relationships. And those are the lessons from Vine Sanctuary. So now we can do Q and A. Wow, thank you so much, Patrice Jones, for this talk. Let us please uh, thank Patrice with uh, some uh, applause. Yes, thank you so much. And now we open up the floor for questions. Um, see, there's no question in the chat and I see no hand raised. Sometimes it takes a minute for people to think. Right. There's yeah, oh, yeah, there's one uh, question in the room here. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just had two different questions that are, I guess, sort of unrelated. Uh, one was, I was wondering if you could elaborate on um, um, ableism being so integral to the idea of the human, I feel like I can kind of like see what you mean, but it would be nice to sort of like get it more like articulated, I think. And the second question is just, um, I'm really curious how roosters solve conflict. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, roosters solve conflict by... Um, Essentially, it's a dance off. Uh, it's like a dance battle. Uh, they will posture to, well, I mean, they solve pro conflicts the same way that anybody else does. It doesn't necessarily get all the way to an argument. So if it gets to an argument, they argue by means of dance offs where they posture. And if if we were in a room, I could sort of show you the the funny little drop wing walk they do. Um, and then they do this thing where they pretend to be eating, but they're not really eating. Um, they fake eat at each other, which is hilarious. And uh, and then they sort of, if, if, if nobody backs down, then they start to fly at each other. They might pull a tail feather or, or peck at the comb, um, but it, it's over usually in about, you know, just a few seconds. And uh, whoever is... Um, who concedes they just they either run away or they stand in like a slump shouldered posture and then the one who won will stand up really straight and crow um but they usually avoid conflict most of the time they avoid conflict um uh, and 
the thing to remember about roosters is that um, modern chickens are the same species as wild jungle fowl. And wild jungle fowl in the wild um, uh, forage in the forests of South Asia, uh, they um, crowing evolved as a way to keep track of each other in the dense foliage. Uh, and so when roosters crow, they're not in fact saying, telling you it's morning. Um, they are telling everybody where they are. Like, I'm over here. I'm over here. Everything's okay over here. Everything's okay over here. Everything's over, okay over here. That's what the crowing is. They're crowing back and forth. And so as the flock forages through the forest, the roosters are at the perimeter and they're crowing back and forth and they're looking out for predators. They have two different alarm calls, one for an aerial predator, one for a ground predator and everybody cooperates um, when there is a predator. So, so it's the norm for roosters to live together. Um, and just like everybody else for whom it's the norm to live together, they mostly um, avoid conflicts getting to the point of a conflict um, by staying away from each other. If two roosters can't get along, they'll hang out in different parts of the flock so that they're not having to stare at each other all the time. A lot of the conflicts that people have with roosters are mostly rooted in having uh, having two roosters like forced to be together all the time and they can't even not be looking at each other. And, and if you think about being locked up with somebody you don't particularly care for, you would probably fight too. Um, so, uh, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, is ableism. Mm, so if you ask um, people who are, you know, not forsworn human supremacy, what is it that gives people, humans, the right to um, use other animals like objects, right? Or do all the different things that people do to the animals. Now, some people don't even bother to justify it. So we'll set them aside. Um, and some people do turn to a religious. So some people to turn to a religious argument where they'll say, you know, God made the animals for us to use. But among the non-religious people, the most common argument for human superiority is based on ability is based on uh we have um consciousness and they don't or we have um language and they don't or we have um uh tool use and they don't uh uh so as i heard a disability rights activist say one day that's not just like ableism that is ableism that is the idea that moral worth resides in abilities. This is why I am always so, uh, we are always at Vine very careful, you know, if people are going to be saying, oh, well, pigs have this kind of cognitive capability or, 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 or pigeons can do math, which they can, um, to make sure I also say, Moral worth doesn't reside in being able to do math. Otherwise, like the people who can do calculus would have like more rights than anybody. Um, so, so, so it, 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 it's, it's the definition of human by means of ability, right? And if you look back, you'll see you know, it was Aristotle who called uh, the humans the rational animal, although some people uh, 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 translate it as the word using animal either way. Um, people with disabilities, whether have been have been um, have been um, treated as subhuman. Because of lack of cognitive capabilities, because of uh, 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 not using spoken words, just like non-human animals had their 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 other ways of speaking treated as as nonsensical. Uh, people with disabilities 
have been and continue to be in some places in the world subjected to all of the same, um, uh, 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 almost all of the same uh, injuries uh, to which non-human animals are subjugated. That includes um, uh, being work made to work without pay, uh, being incarcerated for life, and having your reproduction controlled through forced sterilization. Um, all because of not having particular abilities. So this is a very deep very deep um, connection uh, between ableism and uh, speciesism and uh, uh, the whole idea of human superiority among people who subscribe to that is about ability, which is inherently ableist. So I think, um, uh, you know, how we wobble that remains to be seen. But I think this is a this is a this is a uh, this is a particularly fruitful uh, intersection for interventions. More questions or comments? We have a question from uh, Helena. Yes, thank you so much for your talk. Um, some of us here are engaged with education mm. and critical animal pedagogies. And um, I think that Vine Sanctuary uh, is offering humane education programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would be curious to know something about what uh, the, the participants in those programs pick up from the visit, what they take away. If you can just say something brief about that, it would be very interesting. Mm, okay. Um, we have two different humane education programs. One is a virtual program. Uh, where classrooms full of students adopt an animal at the sanctuary and then they get a, um, for the whole school year, every month, they get an update about their buddy um, and they, um, they uh, along with a humane education lesson that will be focused on um, a topic like... Um, respect or communication. Um, and this is new enough for us that I can't um, report findings. Uh, the on-site program is similar. What, what happens there is the kids come with their, um, with a parent or caregiver um, and they uh, they come and they sit in the pasture and they get a humane education lesson. Again, it might be something like friendship um, or uh, um, consent. Uh, and uh, can you tell I don't do them? So I, I'm not the I'm not the person doing the lessons. So <laughs> that's why I'm being a little bit vague about them. Uh, and uh and then they will, uh, and then they will go and volunteer to help uh, the non-human animals at the sanctuary. So they'll, they'll like rather than being like a petting zoo where they go and just stare at animals, they have, um, they have their lesson in the pasture. And you know, it's it's if the animals want to, if animals want to come and join them, they do, and many do. But it's not right there where the where our non-human community members are, so that it's entirely voluntary for our non-human community members to participate or not. Uh, and uh, and then uh, when the kids go to where the uh, to where like the barns are, they're doing things like scrubbing out the water troughs or um, handing out donated vegetables or or, or doing some sort of work. Um, and and while they are being looked at by the animals, because that's also what happens while they're getting the lesson. What will happen is like cows and alpacas and turkeys will all come down to stare at them while they're getting um, their lesson. 
So it's like a, the flip of a zoo um, because they're the ones um, being watched. And in fact, if we have a rainy day, then they go into a stall in the barn. And so they're inside the stall and the animals are all walking past looking at them. It's pretty funny. Um, so, uh, but I don't, um, you know, what we were hoping they come out from it, obviously with respect for animals, um, and, uh, respect for diversity, um, uh, care, you know, we'll talk, the, the ones who come are, it's, it's better when they're here because they can see animals of different, um, animals of very different uh, morphologies, uh, trends with each other, right? So they'll they'll see how the cows are taking, who are giant, are taking great care not to step on the chickens. And they will see that Val the pig is um, best friends with Shadow the sheep. Um, and, and, and we can point out ways, uh, so, so it's not just respect for difference, but delight in difference. I don't know if that answers at all. I look forward to the day when we've done it for long enough that, that, that I feel comfortable writing something about it. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, we have a last question. I guess it has to be the last one, unfortunately. And it's from Lady. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, talking about your experiences uh, with animals. Uh, I am veterinarian in Colombia. Mm. And <laughs> yeah, and I would like to, you know, uh, bueno, do you know what? you think about the action of veterinarians in activities for social change about animals? Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know how it is in Colombia, uh, but I, I can probably guess. Um, I, I do know um, Juliana. Uh, do you know her who runs the sanctuary there? No, I don't oh. know. Okay. Uh, there's a sanctuary called Juliana's Sanctuary um, th that you should check out. Um, uh, th the um, Here in the United States, and I would imagine in Colombia too, given the beef industry, uh, many veterinarians are um, agents of animal suffering. Um, and that is tragic, uh, because I believe that most people who become veterinarians, uh, choose to become veterinarians because they love animals. Uh, and then in the course of their veterinary training, they are taught callousness, um, and um, it's really very tragic. Uh, I, I think that veterinarians have an enormously important role to play in, um, in animal liberation. Uh, certainly uh, here at the sanctuary, what we like is that, you know, the, the, our veterinarians are also veterinarians for the industry. Um, but they come here and they and they talk about how much they love to be here and how much they love to care for animals who they know aren't going to be killed and how much um, they love. Uh, so I can tell that there's this conflict within them. Um, and there are some veterinarians. I don't know the name. There's at least one organization in the United States of veterinarians who are trying uh, to make a difference. I really would love, this is, I think, actually a, a, a very fruitful place for work to be done because I, I, I believe that many veterinarians are, and veterinary assistants, 
are have pushed down their feelings right um to participate in these systems i don't know about there but here the suicide rate among veterinarians is very high it's the highest of all professions there too yes so I think this conflict, I mean, I think part of that is having to do all the euthanasia of companion animals as part of the suicidality. Um, but I also think it's the, the, the whatever, the, being someone who loved animals so much that they wanted to go to school to take care of animals, then ending up in a profession that requires them to kill or facilitate the exploitation of animals. Oh, it's just dreadful, and I would love to. Um, I would love to uh, to hear your thoughts about that. Um, if not today, another day. If you could write to me, I would love to to be in correspondence with you about that. Uh, yes, it's very complicated because the academic formation. Mm, uh, to veterinarians is based in the in production production for to the industry and in more in country with this uh, where the consumption consumption uh, the of meat is very high and in especially in my um, province uh, Antioquia in Medellin uh, the consuming the, of the pigs is very high, and um, this uh, providence is the most producer of the whole country. And the uh, industrial pigs is very, very uh, stressful, and, mm -hmm. and special for the females. And um, the veterinarians in Colombia um, uh, beginning to, uh, bueno, uh, start to the uh, Thing about the animal welfare uh, and in, in industry is very influencing uh, temple grinding, but the academic is not accepted to the, this change in the industry. The industry is start to the beginning to the change, but the academic veterinarians don't change. Mm -hmm. they, is the very, very stressful for the uh, students but it's very interesting in the last five years, uh, the, uh, uh, bueno, there are more women in the veterinarians. Mm -hmm. this, is, is, uh, uh, this is, is very important because the women are more sensible um, and, and here, here bueno, there um, the women are the beginning or the start to the activism in the school and the veterinary, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's different in the in, in the different um, uh, universities because mm -hmm. this is in, depending the, if interesting about the administ political administration and the veterinary is important because. Um, the professional um, help to the uh, internal uh, product animals mm. is very important for the industry of the veterinaria. The mm. veterinaria for me is a profession to um, grow, uh, grow about the industry animal. Oh, well, that's so hard. Um, I, I see that uh, someone put the link for Juliana Sanctuary in the chat, and I will be happy to introduce you to her. I mean, you could just write to her from the website, but if you want an introduction, or you could just tell her, Patrice told you, uh, to yeah. reach out. I know her, and I know she would love to be in contact with you, and you might feel, I don't know, less alone if you two uh, were in contact with each other. So I hope yeah. that you reach out. Yeah, yeah. I, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And write to me if you like. Um, it, it, through the Vine website is fine. Or um, here, I'll type my email address into the chat for anyone. Thank you. Okay. I write in.
Oh, while uh, Patrice uh, does that. Oh, yeah, there it shows up. Uh, yeah, thank you, first and foremost, Patrice, so much. Let's give Patrice another round of applause, please. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has uh, attended from all around the world and uh, hope to see you another time and um, all the very best. And uh, yeah, take care. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.